come all ye faithful, joyful, and triumphant. And at times we don't feel that. In fact, I had a, a dear friend post this just on Christmas Day or the day before Christmas. Come all ye faithless, joyless, and defeated. For Christmas is for the weary, for the messed up, for the confused, for the anxious, and for the broken. If your life is not Instagrammable, then Christmas is for you. Isaiah 9-2 says, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. There's a very familiar scripture too when the angels appear to the shepherds. And I love how the, the, uh, the Passion Translation says, for today in Bethlehem, a rescuer was born for you. He is the Lord Yahweh, the Messiah. That's good news to cling to at the end of this this crazy, insane year that we have a rescuer and we can cling to that and move forward with joy.
Father, we thank you that as this holiday season continues, as we plan for the next big event, Father, we, we pause and we know what a gift you have sent us in your Son. And the truth that is Emmanuel, that God is with us. And so this morning, whether we are watching online or this morning, whether we are here in person, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would make that real to us. That as we close out 2020, no matter what we think, the truth will supplant any opinion that God is with us. That you have not left us, you have not forsaken us, that you are near. You're near as a, as a whisper is near. You're near as a touch is near. You're near as a hand is near. You have dwelt among us, and we, Lord, every single day that we breathe in air, we behold your glory, and we thank you for that. We pray this in your name, and everybody said Amen. Well, God bless you guys. Be seated. Thank you. Thank you. You guys give them a hand on this last. So for those of you that are online, we text out something that says, if you have prayer, text to this number. We're still working out our technology, Larry, so don't be hard on me yet. We're hoping by the first of the year all the moving parts of, of technology will, will come into focus and we will be able to um, be able to respond in real time for people that are at home. And as you, as you open your Bibles and you turn with me to, um, we're going to be in Philippians, we're going to end in Philippians, but we're going to take the scenic route and we're going to start in Acts 16. So it's the scenic route today, Acts 16. Um, first, on our first pit stop. It's going to be one of those, Mom, when are we there? And we're never going to get there. So just hunker down and, and deal with it. Hey, uh, f- kids, thank you for, for being a part of us. And for parents, that thank you for allowing us to have our kids, uh, our, our teachers off for a Sunday. I, in, in memory of our children's survivors, no, otherwise known as teachers. Um, I, I wore my, my, my 23 kids uh, thing. It's, it's, it's just a great time. We've, we're wrapping, finishing the bathrooms. We've got the final left, and then we're done, 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 da, done, done, in back there, and that is a huge thing. The other thing I want to encourage you on before we, we begin, I really want to encourage you to sign up for Church Center online on your phone app. Church Center Online is going to be our main communication tool in the coming year. So if you need help, we'll we'll get you some help. We'll we'll get those things to you and for you. Um, But I I, I want to really encourage you to do that. Stay tuned for the uh, newsletter that you guys will be getting uh, on your email. If you haven't gotten on your email, uh, sign up for Church Center and we'll get get you those things. But we're going to be using this for one of the main things that we got going on in the 1st of January, which is a a 10-day intensive time of prayer 
that we will start on the 13th and on the 22nd, and that will be be uh, both for people here, and then people online will have a, a private Zoom meeting uh, attendance that you can sign up for, but all that stuff will be online, Facebook, Church Center, all that gloriously fun place that we have is, is, is what we're going to do, okay? Also, one last thing, if you bring your kids to youth tonight, there will be no youth, they'll be outside, that'll be a bad thing for your kids, um, don't drop them off, so... So that's it. Everybody have Acts 16? How many people are happy that this is the last Sunday of 2020? Can I, yeah, it's like, this is, that's the most energy you guys have shown in months. <laughs> Just for all the whole thing, it's like, is 2020 over? Man, it's close. Let's go. Right? And I think for most of us, we have had this, this idea we just had enough of 2020. It's 2020's had enough Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays. We just punt. Call it, call it the year. In fact, it's probably one of the few years where we don't even got to get to the 31st. You could drop the ball today. Call it good. We're good. Let's get on to 2021, right? I don't even know one person. I haven't met one person that's went, man, if we could just get another couple months out of this year. Just puts all warm and fuzzy. Even saying that, some of you guys got shivered to a coal, right? Somebody walked across my, um, you know, that grave because it has been an interesting year. But how we step into the next year is determined how we leave this year. How we step into it. And the question becomes is how do you step out of something that has caused so much to so many? I mean, not to, not to trivialize it or to make it bigger. It doesn't need to be like the big monster underneath the bed. It's been a rough year for a lot of folks, man. I, I, I've talked to people and friends that, that have my job in various parts of the country. And for pastors, it's, it's been inordinately fun. We, we've thought about using this as a way to recruit other pastors. It's like, if you've wanted to pastor, 2020 is your year. You can learn how to talk to a camera. You can learn how to, how to be okay with, with people or not people. Happy faces, sad faces. And then on top of all the trivial things like church, the, the Sunday morning experience, the tough things. The phone calls about, you know, jobs being lost, relationships being damaged, loved ones being lost, loved ones being in isolation. I mean, we have, we have people are in assisted living that you can't hardly even go see without get out of jail free card. And it's, 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 it's been a tough year. But I want us to try to have a healthy perspective. And the question becomes is, how do you have a healthy perspective in a year that keeps on giving so much fun? And that's the word. I mean, I've searched all my, my wealth of vocabulary from being in graduate school. And the one word that I thought would sum up 2020 was fun. Because fun's one of those words, right? Fun's a word. It's like, man, that was fun. Like we went and swam with whale sharks. Man, that was fun. And then, you look, 2020, that was fun. Wow, that's fun. Should sell tickets to this one. But what I began to, to realize is that the Bible gives us a perspective by simply looking at its history that can shape how we see this year and how we step into the coming year. And you can see that in Paul, in Acts 16. Now, Paul, we're going to look at the, the letter to the church at Philippi. But to understand the letter at the church at Philippi, you really got to go to Acts 16. And Acts 16 is the historical context of a guy named Paul going on his third missionary journey 
ending up in Philippi. Everything seems safe. Everything seems happy, copacetic with the world. He shows up outside. He meets this lady named Lydia. And Lydia immediately accepts Christ. And my wife and I had the, the privilege of going. They took Lydia. He's like, oh, you accept the Christ. We've got to baptize you. They took her to a stream that's just on the outskirts of the city of Philippi. Beautiful area. At least tradition says it was a blue, beautiful area. It was like, yeah, I'm sure Lydia was baptized right here in this stream. But I'm going to say, if you were with me that day, it was like, this is beautiful. This is a nice place. And on first blush, Acts 16 at the beginning is like January through March of 2020. Not a bad way to start. Not a bad year. If, you, if I would have stopped 2020 in March, I would now ask you, Hey, how was the year? Oh, it's fun. Not bad. Kind of like Paul's initial foray into Philippi. Like if you would have stopped and asked Paul, I'd go, this place is awesome. They don't even know what I believe in. Some lady accepted Christ. And then I got to dunk her in this amazing stream. It's, it was, it's amazing. It's an amazing year. God brought us here. Oh, God stirred us this Macedonian call that you read about. Well, part of the Macedonian call was this trip to Philippi. But like all stories related to 2020, Paul's foray into Philippi did not end with a baptism in a creek with Lydia. No, no, his, his story got a lot more fun, a lot more fun. You see, everything went right, and so Paul and Silas decided to go to prayer, go to synagogue, going to go to a place of prayer, and they were going to start praying. But along the way, they ran into this slave girl. Now, this slave girl shouted out, these are messengers of God who will bring you this, this message from God. These are holy people. These men, actually the words were, these men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. Wow. Paul and Silas, man, they like got a walking billboard. They don't even have to prove themselves. They just got some slave girl showing up, telling the world, telling the entire city, you need to listen to these guys. These are servants of the Most High God. The problem was, like everything, it didn't stop there. Over and over, every place that they stopped, every place they turned, this lady, this young girl would yell out this stuff. Until such time, Paul got irritated, turned around to this young girl who was known as a fortune teller in the area, making people lots of money, and said, be quiet. In the name of Jesus, you know, cast out a demon. Now you would think that, wow, look at this. The power of God made manifest in Philippi. Not only was Lydia baptized, now we got the power of God manifest in this young girl that was possessed and told fortunes. But it didn't go that way. Why? Because Philippi had a whole lot more fun for Paul than what they thought. It says the people in the town got, got incredibly irritated. Because everybody gets irritated when you mess with their pocketbooks. Right? You ever want to make someone mad no matter where you're at? You can be in a church. You can be in school. You can be in a job. You can be in a restaurant. You mess with somebody's money and you're going to get somebody mad. And Paul made somebody mad. And this is what it says in that. Her master's hopes of wealth were now shattered. And this is verse 19 of chapter 16. So they grabbed Paul and Silas and dragged them before the authorities at the marketplace. The whole city is in an uproar because of these Jews, they shouted to the city officials. They are teaching customs that are illegal for us Romans to practice. A mob quickly formed around against Paul and Silas, and the city officials ordered them stripped 
and beaten with wooden rods. It seems like Paul's fun took a turn. That everything that was going good with Paul immediately turned south. So they were beaten with wooden rods. They were severely beaten. And then they were thrown into prison. And the jailer was ordered to make sure they didn't escape. So the jailer put them into an inner dungeon and clamped their feet in, in, in the stocks. So this morning, I want you to put yourself in Paul or Silas's shoes. Either one's fine. And I want you to tell me, even in your mind's eye, I don't want you to do it now because that would distract all the people that are watching online. They'd be like, who's talking? And I would have to keep it secret. And then I would get letters. So I don't want you talking, but I want you in your thinking, what would it be like to be Paul and Silas in Philippi that day? How's the day going? How's the year? Do you take the shot of Lydia being baptized? Whew, my gosh, that's amazing. Lydia is a business owner. She's, she's, she, she supports ministry. She's, she is this, this important person in the area. She accepts Christ. It's this amazing time. And then they go into prison. God manifests his power. Casts out a demon. Set free the prisoners right out of Isaiah. And he ends up getting beat. Ends up getting thrown in prison. Now maybe you don't know Philippi like Paul knew Philippi. Philippi was a gorgeous city. It's in a beautiful part of, of the area. It's, it's sort of hilly, sort of mountainous. If you, if you were there, you would, you would see they, they had a coliseum, sort of. is a small version of a coliseum where they mocked up battles. A lot of entertainment happened. Across the way, they had big temples. They had huge buildings still in place today that you could see the ruins. They had bathhouses. It was an amazing city. But it was a city that really didn't like Paul that much. And it didn't go according to Paul's plan. So when you ask Paul what was his perspective, I wonder what it would be. I mean, maybe you probably needed to know that the prison that Paul was thrown into was across the street on the wrong side of the tracks. You see, there was this hillside and the people to make a prison just basically dug holes in the side of a, of, a, of a hill and then laid a grate on top of it. There was no TV. They, they didn't get direct TV or, or, or any sort of entertainment. They stuck in a hole in the ground so it was too hot in the summer and too cold in the winter. And he was beaten so severely they just plopped him there. They didn't clean him up. We know that scripture says that they didn't clean him up. They beat him up, stripped him naked, beat him with, with wooden rods, threw him in jail. What would the perspective be? And so in verse 25, he gives us a glimpse of his perspective. That was so much different than what I would have done. Not you guys, the holy righteous people. Me, not so much. Because in verse 25, it says this. Around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening. Now, you got to look at the context. He got beat up. He got accused of something. He has an entire city upset with him. Now he's chained in an inner dungeon because it's not safe enough to put him in the outer one. They've got to bury him in the prison. And they say he's worshiping and praying. And it doesn't make a lot of sense unless this unless their perspective wasn't tied to their predicament. Their perspective wasn't tied to their predicament. It seems that Paul's perspective of life, how he lived post-Damascus, was never tied to his circumstances. 
was never tied to his predicament, good or bad. It wasn't tied when thousands came to Christ. It wasn't tied when he was shipwrecked and beat. It says that in the midst of great injustice, Paul worshiped and prayed with such passion that he attracted the attention of other people that were in prison for probably a right reason. And if your circumstance doesn't tie to your perspective, then what else are you going to do in prison than to pray and to worship? Because no matter where I'm at, no matter where you're at, no matter where you find yourself in this craziness that is 2020, if your perspective of life is not tied to the situation, the predicament that you find yourself in, then you are free, even when you're in prison. And if your perspective is tied to your circumstance, then you're never free even if you never step foot in a prison cell. And the thing about 2020 is that we have allowed the people of God's perspective to be shaped, defined, dictated, and limited by our predicament. And it's not an accurate perspective. Verse 4. Or verse 26, suddenly there was a massive earthquake in the midst of this and the prison was shaken to its foundation and all immediately, uh, all the doors immediately flew open and the chains of every prisoner fell off. Since we have a little bit of time, can I take just a little, little side journey? We're going to stop. At Stuckey's now, since we're in Nebraska. They still have Stuckey's in Nebraska? Whew, that's good. I w- want you to notice something. When your perspective is accurate, you can worship in whatever area you find yourself in. You can pray no matter what you find yourself in. No matter the depth of the injustice, no matter the horrible of the beating no matter how unfair things seem to be. You can worship and you can pray. And in the midst of that, God sets you free. Now, physically we see this story, the context of it was they worship and prayed and the the prison doors fell off. But what we'll discover later on in Paul's life, he was in another prison, shackled to another guy, waiting for his execution this time. Still praying. Physically, he did not get released at this time. This time, the angels didn't show up and bust him out of jail. This time, he had to wait to stand in front of of Caesar. But he was always free. We empower too many people in too many situations that have no right to our lives. We should not, nor should we ever give someone the keys to our own thoughts, the keys to our own perspective. And yet we are constantly captivated, constantly asked to consider something other than what is true. You see, in the midst of where we're at, no matter where we face ourselves, no matter where we find ourselves in this year, No matter our perspective based on our circumstance, based on our predicament, God can still do miracles in the midst of this. Why? Because God is never limited by what we face or what we perceive. God is not contained by any prison cells, real or imagined. God can never be limited. Like I can't mess with him because now he is wrongly accused or wrongly. We got to get him out and get him all fixed up before I can move. No, all that God asks is that we keep our perspective, that we don't shrink God to fit in to our prison doors and the prison cells. We allow God to be God in our lives. 
And that is the way to get through this year and flip the channel to next year. Not to go, God, thank you. Can we just end this? But to look and in the midst of everything, see God in that. And yes, God showed up in 2020. I don't know how to tell some people that like, nope, God washed his hands in 2020. He punted. He went on a sabbatical. Took a whole year off. And we laugh at that, but when you think about how we talk about this last year, I say, oh, well, God's not involved. God forgot us all. God walked out. It's only me and you, Steve, or Jack, because God forgot us. We got to wait to 2021. Maybe God will wake back up. Maybe he'll return from the islands and allow us to talk to him again. Because surely he wasn't involved in 2020. That is allowing our perspective to be shaped by our predicament. And that is not of God. It says in verse 27, the jailer woke to see the prison doors wide open. And he assumed the prisoners had escaped, so he drew his sword to kill himself. Well, Paul shouted, stop, don't kill yourself, we're here. The jailer called for the lights and ran to the dungeon and fell down trembling. And he brought them out and asked, sirs, what must we do to be saved? And he replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved along with everyone in your household. Isn't it amusing? Isn't it funny? Isn't it incredibly exciting? That when our perspective does not shrink based on our circumstance, that God still does the miraculous in the midst of our circumstance. In the midst of a prison, in the midst of a prison, a man comes to Christ. Not because God airlifted Paul out. And like, where's Paul? Paul's sitting down on the Barca lounger waiting for the, for the jailer to come back because he did not want the jailer to be punished for God's miracle. In fact, God's miracle spoke to the jailer louder than anything that Paul could have done. It says, they shared the word of the Lord with him, verse 32, and with all who lived in his household. Even at that hour of the night, the jailer cared for them and washed their wounds. And then he and everyone in his household were immediately baptized, and he brought them into his house and set a mill before them. He and his entire household rejoiced because they believed in God. Can you imagine how the jailer's perspective changed? Oh, my God. If the jailer was 2020 or looked at 2020, the jailer would have been like, man, this is an amazing year. I got to know my Savior. Let me tell you about 2020. And this year, people came to Christ. This year, the church did not die. I feel like we need to be like Mark Twain. You know, what, what was it? The, the, the rumors of my demise are greatly exaggerated. The church is not dead. But maybe our circumstance has allowed our perspective to be shaped in such a way that we've bought into that lie. Oh, you know, it's, it's just, look at, look at it. Not even half people are here Sunday. Yeah, but they're online. And they're enjoying their family. And church rules are being rewrote. And as a guy that earns a keep doing this, I'm kind of liking that. I'm kind of tired of the old rules. I'm kind of tired of the old laws because why? They shrink God to contain himself into four walls. But the kingdom of God cannot be bound by this. So if my perspective is not dictated by my circumstance or my predicament, then my perspective can be as as large as the God that I serve is. Now, if I shrink him to fit, he must hate me, then he's not worth serving because he's as tiny and as insignificant as our circumstances. Is it okay? Last of the year, might as well just like, just peel off the band-aid, rip it off, pull the scab with it. It'll heal up. I'll rub some methylate on it in a little bit. Okay, so, rehash. Right? Paul's in Philippi. Dunks a lady. 
praise God, glory to God. Turns around, casts out a demon. Gets beat up, thrown in prison. Praise worships. All the prison doors fall open. Jailer freaks out. Jailer gets saved. Everything's good. Next day happens because this is 2020. There's no way it's going to end there. 2020 shows up and Paul's like, this is awesome. I'm eating dinner at the house of the guy in charge of, of, of keeping me in prison. Who would have thunk it? Next morning shows up. Government gets involved. And they go, oops, sorry, didn't mean to beat you. Didn't know who you were, my bad. Can we just forget about this? Can we move on? Because all government officials want the best for you, especially when there's a lawsuit coming. And so they go to Paul and Silas like, hey, we're sorry. But here's the funny thing. They take you, I, Larry, I didn't mean to just kick the tar out of you, but on the way out of town, I'm going to apologize to you. Well, come on with me to the gates of the city, and, and they apologize to him, then kick him out. So what's your perspective? What would you write about Philippi? What tone would you take? Bunch of corrupt politicians can't trust a one of them. They put me in a jail. They incarcerated me for nothing. They framed me for taking somebody's money who was actually exploiting another person. Stupid government officials. And don't trust the city leaders because they're just as corrupt as the people that are running the show because they dragged me to them guys and they're the guys that got me beat. Dear Church of Philippi, I don't like you and I'm not sending you anything for Christmas. In fact, if you took Philippi at a whole, you might say Philippi became 2020 in a geographical area because it was a place that never stopped giving. Over and over and over, the story gets more complex. The story gets more layered. Until now, years later, Paul's set free, but Paul's back in prison. This time in Rome, awaiting execution. And this time, he's writing letters to the churches that he helped form. And one of those letters was to Philippi. And you would think at the story, you'd be like, man, I am going to light them dudes up. I'm going to write a letter to the editor. I'm going to put it on TikTok, Facebook, so, and Twitter. I'm going to put it on Instagram. I might even put it on parlor for all you conservative people that left Facebook. <laughs> I'm going to blow them up because they imprisoned me wrongly, because they treated me wrongly, because they were unjust to me. Because we all know that the story that we write is all about us. It has nothing to do with what God's doing through us. It has to do with us and our worldview and our perspective. And our perspective is shaped by our circumstance. And when our perspective is shaped by our circumstance, it becomes rather short-sighted and mean. Well, that's kind of harsh. Like, yeah, it's kind of harsh, but it's the end of the year. And it's 2020. What do you expect from me? And really, if we looked at our social media feeds, wow. Wow. But what Paul writes to a church, to a group of people that worship the same God is completely completely and antithetical to today's world. And can I say just one more thing since it's 1048? Can I point out the obvious that we as a people of God forget? at times that scripture shouts at us 
from its context. That's simply allowing the Bible to be scripture. To look at a man's journey to a city that went south. And then to flip the pages historically to see where he ended up in writing a letter screams at us on how to respond, to react, and interpret, not just last year, but the years to come. By simply opening up the book and going, my God, this guy was treated so unfairly, and yet what he, what he writes is to this church is crazy. Chapter 1, verse 12. I want you to know, my dear brothers and sisters, that everything that has happened to me here has helped to spread the good news. Wait, I thought you got beat with rods. Yep, I did. I thought you were thrown in prison unjustly. Yep, I was. I thought you were escorted out by the city fathers on the way out of an apology just to get you out of town so that you couldn't hold them accountable for beating a Roman citizen. Yep, that was me. But everything that happened has helped me to spread the gospel. For everyone here, including the whole palace guard, now he's talking about being in prison in Rome. By the whole palace guard knows that I am in chains because of Christ. And because of my imprisonment, most of the believers here have gained confidence and boldly speak God's message without fear. That is a perspective of a man that does not allow his circumstance to define or to shrink the God that he worships. He goes on in verse Chapter 2, verse 15, he tells them to be light of this world. In verse chapter 3, verse 1, he says to rejoice in the Lord. And when you read his letter in totality, knowing what his experience was in Philippi, knowing that he's now writing a letter in a prison, waiting to go to his death, and you read it in its totality, like, my God, how do you get that perspective? I mean, if I pass the mic and like, what's your favorite memory of 2020? And we'll say it has to be fun. It, 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 they would be, majority of them would be bad because the majority of them that I have were bad. But it's because I allow my perspective to be shaped by my circumstance. You guys know Dave and I were overseas in Bosnia when Trump first shut down the government. And what we heard back there was, nobody's getting in. And I'm, I'm in, a, in a beehive field in between Sarajevo and, and Croatia being made fun of by, by veterans of the Serbian war. Oh, you Americans. Now, I could choose to remember everything that was tough about that trip. The fact that we landed at midnight in Sarajevo, got in a car, got in a hotel about 1.30, and my phone blows up at 3, and we have to be on the road by 6 the next morning. And the phone was, when are you coming home? Because did you hear your president shutting the borders? And back then, it was like, well, yeah, okay. Hello, United, this is Dave. Yes, I fly with you a little bit. Can you help me? Absolutely, sir, we'd love to help you for $10,000 a ticket. Perspective. But the different perspective was is that we were able to spend four days in a field with men that loved Jesus, make friends for life, Still talk to Dario monthly. Perspective is not based on circumstance. And so when you read Paul's letter to the church of Philippi, you have to wonder what happened. He either got hit in the head a lot, or he was able to not allow himself to be defined, dictated, or limited by the circumstance he currently found himself in. And when I read Philippi from the perspective of a guy in jail waiting death, 
then his perspective was accurate and never tied to what he was facing. Can I say for too long the church in North America has allowed their circumstances to define their perspective? For too long. We want this vibrant, robust faith. We cry out for miracles. We want the word of God to come alive. And yet we believe that an election... A geographical country can dictate or define God. And the places that I've been, he can't. No matter what circumstance the church finds itself in, its perspective is that he's always worshiping, it's always worshiping the King of Kings. Emmanuel, God with us. That God with us is not defined because if he was defined or limited by history, he would have been put to death by the Egyptians. When Moses came out and, and, and floated down the river, they would have offed him there. The world would have put Abraham to death. David would have died when he faced Goliath. Samuel been run out of town. All the disciples would have remained fishermen or tax collectors and other assorted sinners. The church would never take root in Burma or Thailand or never begin to get a breath in Europe. Why? Because, well, the circumstances are difficult, but the circumstances never define or dictate what God wants to do through humanity because God wants to bring humanity to him. That's what Christmas is. But that requires an accurate perspective. A perspective that is not defined or dictated by a predicament. Well, Paul is in jail. Ah, Paul's one step closer to Jesus. Do you see the difference? Oh, you don't know how tough it is. Nope. Nope. I can say that, well, man, I, I know some of it's tough. I mean, I know I have dear friends that, that are, have been at home for, for three months because they're waiting for a surgery. Or a mother-in-law that's in, 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 in a assisted living that you can't go see. I can't even get her to bake me anything right now. They're breaking my heart. I know that people are afraid to come into to, to, to church. Because of, of the virus and, the, and, and being at risk. I know that work is, is tough and drying up. I know that a lot of people that are working in the oil fields, man, they, they can't, there's nothing out there. And then for those that are still on unemployment, the, that bill didn't pass, and so the unemployment's drying up today. People are looking at bills going, man, I hope that boy signed something soon. That's a reality. That's a circumstance. That's a predicament. But our perspective should never be tied to that. So if we wrapped up the year and followed Paul's advice to the church at Philippi that he wrote while in prison awaiting Sentencing, he writes this. Now, dear brothers and sisters, you group of people that were with me, one final thing. And if you read Philippi, Paul plays the role of a preacher. He quits. He says, I'm wrapping this up about four different times. Finally, finally, finally. And this was another finally. Finally, one last thing. I just got to tell you one more thing. Why? Because Paul's perspective is, man, you guys, God has so much in store for you. Again, let me tell you just one more thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think on the things that are excellent 
and worthy of praise. He urges his readers like he urges us today. He urges us, the survivors of 2020, to think on what is good and what is pure and what is true. Fix your thoughts on what is true. And there is nothing more true than Jesus. Nothing more true on this globe, on this orb that circles the sun than Jesus Christ. He himself told his disciples in John 14, John records it. He says, look, man, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. I'm it. And I know that there's this, this great philosophical debate that has been going on for years. Well, there's no truth. It's just your opinion. Well, truth has never been determined or dictated by majority rule. Hate to say that. I don't care how many votes votes it gets. Non-truth is non-truth, but truth is truth. Capital T, non-negotiable truth. Jesus is truth. So when, when Paul writes to a group of people where he should say, man, steer clear of them. Instead, he encourages them. He equips them and says, focus on and the one that brought you here, focus on Jesus. Focus on, on, on what is true. And then he goes, focus on what is honorable, right, pure, and lovely. Those things that conform to God's standards. Those things that are morally excellent. I don't know about you, but I have been in awe of our society lately. Not in a good way. I've been awe in our society lately because it's, it's, it's so enamored with failure. I'll give you an example. So Drew's up there playing guitar, and Drew's shredding like he always shreds. Society would go, man, I hope that guy screws up. Because if he is bad, maybe I'm not as terrible. So instead of looking at Drew going, man, if I played like 10 years, Drew, do you think I could? I know I couldn't play that, but maybe I could play Leonard Skinner. Instead of looking at him as, a, as something to be aspired to, I take him and I squish him down, not so that I can raise up to his level of competency, but that he shrinks down to my ineptitude. And if you look at the world today, what do we celebrate? What do we honor? Definitely not what is good and right and pure and holy. What we honor is just what's stupid and wrong. What sells clicks? What's bad? Hey, man, did you hear? Did you hear what Trish did? I mean, I know you think Trish is nice. Trish ain't nice. It's all over the web. I know you think Trish is like a godly woman. Trish ain't. That's going to go online and everyone's going to like, what Trish do? (laughs) Go on 23church.org for next year now. Um, But see, we, we tear people down. Our society. We no longer aspire to our heroes We aspire to the base issues of our society. Celebrities now are looked at as experts. Failures is 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 celebrated as a success. Working for the man is just working for the man. Why do I need to do that? We tear one another down so that we don't aspire to anything other than just not as bad as that. I had, a, I had a, a, a pastor a while ago say publicly, and he was a, he was a pastor of a giant church. He says, this, this job's not going to be in existence for long. And we see that in our politicians. We see that in our, in our celebrities. We see that in any sort of public figure. We seek to destroy. We seek to find the fault. To be the cynic to lower everybody down to nothing. 
Because if we lower everybody down to nothing, then I don't have to aspire to anything. And if I don't have to aspire to anything, then I'm going to assume that 2021 is just going to be another version of 2020. Just one more 12-month cycle of fun. But if my perspective is not tied to my situation, my predicament, and I can look and I can concentrate on things that are excellent. And for the cynicalists, if I could talk to Paul when I go back to heaven, when I go to heaven, if I went back to heaven, I could have a book. <laughs> Sorry. But one of the questions I would love to ask Paul is like, dude, help me understand this. Help me understand you're in prison, you were beat up, you were shipwrecked, you were ridiculed, you were mocked, you were, you were tortured. You were beat within an inch of your life. You were thrown into a hole that not even wiped the blood off. In fact, your jailer cleaned you up. And yet you say to these people, think on these things. Think on what's good, what is pure. Think on what is true. Think on these things. And he goes on and says in verse 9, he says, keep putting into practice all you have learned and received from me. Everything you heard from me and saw me doing, then the God of peace will be with you. The God of peace. He doesn't say circumstances will change. He doesn't say, you know what, if you pray loud, you stand on your head, you lift one leg up, and you pray in Old Testament, King James Version, these and nows, God's going to fix everything. God's going to get you out of the jail that you find yourself in. God's going to give you a new job. God's going to bring you your heart's desire. God's going to give you a chauffeur. God's going to remove your bad reputation. God's going to do it all. No, because if that was the case, then my perspective would be tied to my circumstance, my predicament. But what Paul writes... If you do the things that I have done, then the God of peace will be with you. The God of peace, that peace, that word peace comes from the Old Testament, shalom. It's free from worry. Dude, you're in prison, locked up, waiting to go see Caesar who wants your head on a stick. I don't have to worry anymore because God of peace is with me. And that's never defined or dictated or determined by my situation. In verse 11, he goes on, that God of peace, that other word means contentment, satisfaction. How can you be satisfied with 2020? Well, how can Paul be satisfied chained up to a soldier in a prison, which is nothing more than a hole, in a bigger hole, with a grate that they lowered down? writing letters by candlelight. And I've learned, he says, though, to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or want, and then he goes on and says this. He goes, because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So, what do we got? Five more days? Four more days. Four more days? Till the fun stops and the fun begins. 2021, I don't know about you, but if they drop the ball on the 31st, I'm not assuming much will change. You won't be able to go out and, and sit in restaurants and support your local because you can't. So my situation does not change 
January 1, 2021. But my perspective can. And I can learn how to be content in all things. Why? Because I think, I focus, I concentrate, I meditate on what is true and what is good and what is morally excellent. And if I think on those things, then the God of peace is with me. Which means he never leaves me nor forsakes me. That he's there in good times and in bad. He's there in in doubts and assurance. He's there when I'm faithful and he's there when I'm faithless. Because he is not tied to my circumstance. He surpasses those things. And so for me, I'm excited about 2021. And I know that that is countercultural right now. I don't think it's going to be great, be an adventure. I don't think it's going to be easy, but man, it's going to be fun. Why? Because the God of the Bible, the God that we worship, that we sing to, and his son Jesus that we adore, he came to set us free And if we are free, then we are free indeed. And no one, no government, no thought, no societal change can change that. If the Son sets you free, then no matter if you find yourself in a prison of somebody else's making, you are free indeed. And because you're free, because you're free, You can have a perspective that will change the world around you. And you can worship in prison. And you can pray when things seem against you. You can pray to the God that you profess, bloodied and bruised by wooden sticks. Blood covered. Can't hardly move. You can still pray. Why? Because your circumstance has never stopped God. So with that, I want to say, see you 2020. See? Thumbs up. And let us step into 2021 with great anticipation. With great anticipation. I want to encourage you to um, continue supporting us if you're online Go to our website, go to Church Center, sign up for that, hit the give button, walk you through all that. If you're here, there'll be an usher out there. Your obedience, your faithfulness allows allows us to keep doing what we're doing. You're going to hear a lot of stuff talked about in January. At the end of January, you'll see Dario. We've talked about that. Uh, We'll we'll figure out some stuff to do for him. Um, We're going to pray from the 13th to the 22nd. You'll hear more stuff about that. You'll be given an e-book to follow. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna concentrate on on what it means to to pray in the coming weeks, not next week, but starting on the second week in January. I want to take four weeks and talk to you about what God has shown me for 2021, and 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 how in these next seven years of of my job here, I can't believe I'm thinking seven years that that God has asked us to do three very specific things. He's asked us to have a heart of prayer. He's asked us to facilitate and build community. community, And he's asked us in everything that we do to celebrate our Savior. So we're going to talk about what that means. We're going to talk about what it means to have a heart of prayer. We're going to talk about what it means and the reason why community is so vital. And we're going to talk about the reason that we're all here, which is not to get T-shirts. It is, I know. Larry, if you want to buy some, though, we'll wear them. But it is about our Savior. It is about Jesus, him and him alone. Well, Father, I thank you so much for today. I thank you that, God, you've given us the wisdom through your Holy Spirit to have an accurate perspective. 
So I pray, God, that you would speak to us these next few days. God, if we need to repent by allowing, we've allowed our, 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 our predicament to shrink our perspective. God, would you expand our eyes? Would you expand our hope? Would you expand our future to incorporate you? Let us see you in everything that we are, everything that we do, every step that we take. And let us rejoice. The God of peace is always with us. We pray this in your name. And everybody said, God bless you guys. Have a great rest of the week. Man, we will see you next week as we start a brand new year. Woo-hoo. Woo-hoo. 2021. Thank God.